Okay. So the talk uh, is on Gero science, which I'll define in biotech venture capital. Here you can see uh, a ginkgo leaf. This is a leaf of an immortal tree. I think they live thousands of years uh, potentially, and uh, it's long been a symbol for longevity throughout Asia. Um, I'm really pleased to see that the Aging Society and the Venture Capital Society have uh, coalesced. Um, when I was at Oxford, uh, I don't think you guys ever did a joint uh, event, and I don't even know if the Aging Society really, really existed at that time. I had to create sort of an informal, informal group, so it's good to see that uh, there's enough interest to create a formal organization. Okay, so this is the disclosure slide, some of the companies that I hold equity in or consult for so that you know that where my biases lie. Um, so this is uh, actually an image of uh, the Fountain of Youth, a painting by Louis Cronach the Elder, and you can see uh, old and infirm people on the left coming into the fountain and then leaving uh, young and uh, rejuvenated. Um, so hopefully one day we can achieve that and I'll sort of lay out some of the steps to get there. So um, I'll give you a background on geroscience, uh, a primer on venture capital and biotech entrepreneurship, and time allowing some propaganda about brain aging that I just can't resist uh, talking about to anyone who will listen. And then uh, we should have 15 or 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. So um, we're, we're facing a pretty serious problem globally, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, but also in Asia, um, called the silver tsunami. So we have global demographic aging and the economists among us will know that demography is destiny. So we have an aging global population and uh, we're not equipped to deal with that. And you know, humanity has never dealt with this kind of problem before. Granted, it's a good problem to have because it simply means that people are living longer and healthier lives than ever before. So to show you some of this data in uh, 2010, you can see the countries in red um, are those that uh, have a population, uh, have an age population where over 20% of the population is over 65 years of age, uh, which is the retirement age in most countries. So it's mostly Europe and Japan in 2010. But if you fast forward to 2050, it's pretty much the whole world uh, that other than Africa that is in this, uh, this situation. Um, and this is being driven by the baby boomers uh, came home from World War II, uh, celebrated and had a lot of kids. And uh, you can see that we're sort of at the steepest point of that curve in 2020 now. Um, and you know, some uh, economists predict by about 2035, uh, when, when this trend has, has maximally uh, expanded uh, is when the United States government will be bankrupt and will need to devalue the currency. So uh, this is you know, as, as serious as things get uh, economically, the global uh, demographic aging crisis and the silver tsunami. Part of the reason it's so serious is because of the dependency ratio. So the ratio of people who work and who are productive uh, and contributing to society, paying taxes, et cetera, versus those that are reliant upon uh, the rest of society. And you can see all of these curves are, are rising and Japan has the most serious situation, also because they don't allow a lot of immigration. So um, I like to sort of play this pop quiz, uh, this trick on people, um, in which I ask, what do you think is the main risk factor for lung cancer? And most people would just, their knee-jerk reaction would be, well, uh, smoking, obviously. But technically, that's not true. Um, it's technically aging because you don't see a lot of, you know, 30-year-olds walking around with lung cancer, even if they're smoking multiple packs a day. It actually takes time for the damage to accumulate and for the uh, cellular and physiological repair systems to break down with age such that the tumor can actually occur, such as immune senescence. So, um, so it's true that you know, smoking will dramatically increase your risk of cancer, but it's, it's necessary and not sufficient. You also need biological age. So this applies to pretty much every uh, disease, every modern Western disease, hat tip to Avi Roy, who I think might be on the call for making this beautiful uh, figure here, but you can clearly see there's an exponential risk for pretty much all of the major age-related disease, all the killers uh, uh, as a function of age. And people usually talk about, oh, you know, they have a relative who died from cancer, for example. But in reality, you might as well say, well, they died from aging that weakened their constitution such that cancer could emerge. So it's kind of this sort of cloaked uh, hidden variable. It's like a latent variable 
um, that aging is really driving all of these diseases. And so you have all of these societies like the American Cancer Society or, or the British Heart Foundation, et cetera, people sort of demonize and rightfully so these diseases, but they don't really recognize that the primary underlying cause is age. And you know now the dialogue is starting to move toward age. So um, the goal of this field of geroscience, which I'll define properly in a minute, is simply to extend healthy lifespan, to extend that period of life in which you're happy, healthy, and productive. It's not just to extend lifespan per se. Um, modern medicine has already achieved that fairly well uh, by adding five or 10 years at the end of life, but those are usually not high quality adjusted years, quality adjusted lifespan uh, or, or quality adjusted uh, life years, qualities. Um, those are usually years spent in, in relatively poor health. Uh, and, and it's very expensive uh, for the global medical system. So if we could just extend the healthy period of life, that would be ideal. So um, I'll put forward this premise that the first drug that's proven to extend healthy lifespan will become the most impactful and valuable drug of all time. And what may come as a surprise to some of you is that these drugs already exist that extend healthy lifespan. And they extend healthy lifespan in mice by about 20%. Uh, but the clinical trials in human health span have not yet been conducted. Though some of these drugs have already been approved for specific diseases, such as rapamycin and metformin uh, and some over-the-counter substances as well that I'll get into. So this is a medical revolution waiting to happen. Um, another sort of apparent truism, but people don't really realize that aging causes most disease. Aging is the root cause of most disease in the Western world. Drugs that work well or are curative target the root causes of disease and examples antibiotics. Therefore, targeting aging itself will yield better medicines than the, the typical symptom palliation philosophy of pharma today. So to define geroscience, this term was actually coined by uh, a group uh, at the Buck, Gordon Lithgow and Felipe Sierra at the uh, National Institute on Aging a couple of years ago. And it's something like the definition, something like the field of biomedical research on the biological mechanisms by which aging causes disease. And uh, the NIH, which is a major funding body in the United States, about $45 billion a year research budget, created this trans NIH geroscience interest group. And there's also a journal called Geroscience now, which I quite like. So the field of geroscience has expanded dramatically in the last 20 years due to pivotal experiments in genetics and caloric restriction that show that aging can be slowed in laboratory animals. Um, this, the explosion in research over the last two decades uh, is thanks in part to improved understanding of the biology of aging, the basic fundamental molecular mechanisms underlying the aging process, which some of which are described here in this paper, The Hallmarks of Aging, I highly recommend. I actually launched a company, Samsara Therapeutics with one of the founders that, or one of the senior authors, Guido Cromer. Um, and uh, because we know that aging is tractable and we know that there are a finite number of types of damage that cause aging, we've been able to intervene and extend healthy lifespan across species in the lab. Um, so if you only read one paper about the biology of aging, this you could do worse than this one here, the hallmarks of aging. I don't have time to get into all of these hallmarks today, but I'll touch on a few of them in brief. And uh, to be specific about some of the types of interventions, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the, some of the favorites. Um, metformin is a diabetes drug, a relatively safe drug. It extends lifespan in mice by about 5%. You have to get the dose perfectly right, uh, but that was uh, a, a pretty early and interesting finding. We also have evidence that it extends the healthy lifespan of diabetics beyond that of age-matched uh, controls uh, in uh, epidemio epidemiological studies. Those are not interventional studies, uh, but, but they're pretty compelling. Um, another intervention is the enhancement of autophagy, this process of cellular uh, turnover of, uh, of the organelles within a cell and internal components of cells. And autophagy occurs when you do fasting, caloric restriction, as well as exercise. Rapamycin is another uh, small molecule that's an approved pharmaceutical drug. It's used for um, organ transplants to suppress the immune system. To, so that the patient doesn't reject the organ, as well as certain types of cancer. And uh, one of the companies that, that we launched at Apollo is actually working on the chemical structure, the scaffold of rapamycin to minimize those immune suppressive effects while retaining the lifespan, extending beneficial properties. 
Of course, you have the classic caloric restriction. This has been known for at least a century. This guy, Clive McKay at Yale in the early 20th century had shown that you can extend the healthy lifespan of mice by about 30% with a 30% with a caloric restriction. A relatively new one in the last couple of years is the ablation of senescent cells, and we'll get into that. But these are basically zombified damaged cells that stick around when they shouldn't stick around, and uh, they result in um, chronic pro-inflammatory signaling uh, that accelerates aging. And then the growth hormone receptor knockout mice, um, growth hormones, anabolic hormones, insulin, uh, and others actually are pro-aging. They're absolutely necessary for life, but uh, they're sort of a double-edged sword in the sense that insulin and growth hormone um, actually accelerate aging. Um, and there's a population of people in, I believe, Nicaragua who have a loss of function mutation in the gro growth hormone receptor and they're dwarves, uh, but they never get cancer. Uh, they get other diseases more, more commonly, but they don't get cancer or it's incredibly rare. So um, anyway, these are some of the, some of the favorite interventions, but there, there are many more and we can get into that. Um, this, this slide I call the social proof slide <laughs> to show that there are a lot of sort of prominent groups getting into the aging space. Probably the most prominent among them has been Google in the last couple of years. I guess it was almost a decade now. It feels like it was just yesterday, but um, Google created a company called Calico, California Life Company, and uh, the head of it is Arthur Levinson, who is the head of Genentech. And uh, they partnered with the big pharma, AbbVie, um, and put down $2.5 billion uh, over the last few years uh, to advance uh, their pipeline. So they're very secretive. Nobody really knows quite what they're up to. They're a little bit like the Bell Labs uh, of, of yesteryear, but, uh, but people are watching them very closely and they have a lot of very talented scientists. Um, you may recognize some of these other names. I won't touch on all of them, but uh, I'll, I'll call out Apollo Ventures and Cambrian Biopharma because I work and work for, for them. And uh, we've created a number of different uh, new companies targeting various aspects of aging. One more that I'll mention is um, Craig Venter's group, Human Longevity Inc. So you've probably heard of Craig Venter. He uh, was one of the genomics pioneers who kind of erased the NIH uh, to sequence the human genome and that sort of competition. It's very contentious, but that competition uh, seems to have accelerated the pace of advancement in the genomics and sequencing space. Um, so we can get into these later if you have questions. Uh, I, I mentioned senescent cells. These are these zombie cells that accumulate with age. They seem to accumulate because uh, the immune system goes senescent and cannot eliminate these, these damaged cells. So um, cells can undergo many forms of damage. It can be telomere attrition, can be uh, other forms of genomic damage, can be uh, proteostatic stress, mitochondrial stress. Many different types of stress will result in cells basically stopping cell division and trying to repair the problem. And if they can't repair it, they either undergo apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, or they become senescent. They just stop dividing and uh, they change their morphology. So you can see down here in the bottom right, on the left, you have fibroblasts, normal, healthy fibroblasts are sort of spindly, but then you can see these senescent cells on the right and they take on this fried egg phenotype. Uh, as uh, Lynn said, they get big, fat and ugly. I think that's a little rude, uh, but uh, of course uh, that's uh, what they look like under the microscope and they also stain for a certain lysosomal marker. So um, senescent cells have been shown to accumulate uh, across species. And there was this really watershed paper some years ago at the Mayo Clinic. Um, finding that if you genetically ablate senescent cells, you eliminate some but not all senescent cells in mice, you get about a 27% median lifespan extension. And the mice are healthier in pretty much every way that you look. So that set off sort of a race uh, of a handful of companies developing drugs that will selectively eliminate uh, or quell the, uh, the damage caused by senescent cells. One of these companies uh, is called Clearo Biotech, which uh, we launched at Apollo Ventures. It's based in, uh, in Holland. And uh, we published a paper, um, I believe it was 2014 in Cell, in which um, a senolytic peptide was able to uh, reverse the aging of a progeric rapidly aging mouse and, uh, and was protective in various models of tissue damage and uh, in, in disease models in mice. And you can see here, uh, the change when a senolytic is administered uh, to uh, when it's administered, not administered at all, the mice look old, as you can see. And then uh, when you've been giving this drug and preventing the 
accumulation of senescent cells, the mice actually look uh, quite young and normal. Um, we're not the only or even the first group to get into the senescent space. The first was Unity Biotech in San Francisco. Um, they've hit a rough patch recently with uh, a phase two study in osteoarthritis with an MDM2 inhibitor, BCL2 inhibitor. Um, but uh, that was the first clinical trial billed as a uh, senolytic to ablate senescent cells. So that might not have been the right drug or the might indi right indication, but there's so much evidence accumulating across species that the ablation of senescent cells is salutary or beneficial. So I think it's only a matter of time before senolysis, the elimination of senescent cells becomes, you know, a hot new area, not, you know, like immune oncology or checkpoint inhibitors. It's going to be a hot area. And a lot of the uh, invest, uh, equity, equity research analysts and uh, broader community is catching on to the senolytic space, but it's been going on for you know, 15 years now. Another favorite uh, that gets a lot of press attention is called heterochronic parabiosis. And uh, that's a complicated way of saying you surgically fuse the, uh, the uh, circulatory system of a, an old and a young mouse such that they share blood. And the old mouse gets a bit younger, uh, but the young mouse notably gets a lot older. And so according to uh, pioneers in the field like Arena Convoy, uh, it seems to be that there's actually bad stuff in the old blood rather than good stuff in the young blood for the most part. Uh, so the, the bad stuff in the old blood is dominant to the, the good stuff in the young. Uh, so what we could do is scrub out the bad stuff or replace what's missing. Um, and there are a lot of groups working on this one uh, recent deal was the acquisition of Alcahast by the Spanish uh, blood products uh, company Griffles. Um, and a lot of this work was pioneered in the Tom Rando lab and with Arena Convoy uh, in, in the Bay Area. Um, a recent uh, paper from Sol Vieta's lab at UCSF um, found that actually you can confer the benefits not just of of, uh, of youth or, or, or confer the uh, negative aspects of age through the blood, but actually the benefits of exercise as well. So exercise as well as caloric restriction and the best things, best kinds of interventions uh, for aging that we're aware of, uh, wouldn't it be great if you could actually uh, bestow some of the benefits of exercise or caloric restriction without actually having to do the work um, or for people who are not in a position to do the exercise or caloric restriction, such as people with a disease, serious disease. So this came out recently in science. You can exercise uh, an old mouse, you isolate the plasma and inject it into another old mouse that has not exercised. And then you put it through some behavioral studies and you look at a neurogenesis. Uh, and, uh, and the results were you transfer the blood from the exercise mouse to sedentary mice and you the, the lazy mouse actually enjoys the cognitive benefits. The authors identified the main blood factor that is apparently uh, operative here, GLPD-1, uh, and it's produced in the liver. And what they did was they injected GLPD-1 into aged mice, which was sufficient to enhance cognitive function. So they isolated a single molecule, single protein that conferred much of these benefits. Um, so uh, just to briefly touch on some of the data, if you inject GLPD-1, there's a reduction in errors in a memory task. There's an increase in the, the protein level of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is uh, one of the most interesting uh, cognitive enhancers in, in brain regeneration molecules. And there was also increased neurogenesis in the dentate gyrus uh, after dosing with this. Um, and this is a critical area in the hippocampus for memory and learning. Another really interesting one uh, to do with uh, blood in a way is the transplant of young bone marrow. This is very recent, uh, just in the last you know, year. Um, uh, it's, it's been shown that you can extend the healthy lifespan of mice by transferring young bone marrow into old bone marrow. So just as a primer on bone marrow, it contains the most exceptional type of stem cell, the hematopoietic stem cell. Um, hematopoietic stem cells, they form the blood, all of the blood and the immune system. And bone marrow transplant uh, is already routinely performed in humans for disease like leukemia and serious autoimmunity. And uh, it basically, it's uh, just an infusion. So you, you isolate the bone marrow from a patient at iliac uh, crest, I suppose, of, of one patient, and then you infuse it in, into the bloodstream of another. And the HSCs, they actually home into the bone marrow. It's pretty amazing. So you could do that as an outpatient procedure. And we know that the bone marrow niche 
declines with age uh, due to uh, inflammation, the accumulation of fat. Uh, and that, actually, that process actually uh, slowed in uh, people who exercise a lot. So another reason to exercise is it pres preserves the, the uh, sort of function of your bone marrow. So here's some of the data uh, from two different papers. When the first paper came out, uh, I didn't really believe it, but another paper from another group uh, came out recently and, and there have been a bunch of other uh, results corroborating this uh, that you, you get between a, a 12 and 28% uh, median lifespan extension and also maximum lifespan extension when you take the bone marrow uh, from young mice and transplant it into an old mouse. Um, another favorite that I've mentioned is caloric restriction. This slows cognitive aging in primates and uh, all kinds of other intervention, uh, all kinds of other uh, readouts in primates, and it extends lifespan in all model organisms testing. So this is really probably the most rock solid area of geroscience research. Uh, and so it's been, you know, for years, people have been trying to develop small molecule drugs that mimic some of the benefits of caloric restriction. One of the earliest companies to do this was called Sertris that was acquired by GSK some years ago for 720 million in Biobucks. And that was a contentious deal, um, but I did some homework on it, did some digging and spoke with some of the team at GSK who actually did that deal and uh, some people associated with Sertris. And, um, and the molecules performed as, uh, as promised, uh, but for reasons of internal politics, they were not uh, carried forward by GSK, but they did go into phase two studies. Um, so these, these drugs were actually sirtuin activators and sirtuins are histone deacetylases and ADP, ADP ribosylases that mediate a lot of the benefits of caloric restriction. They're involved in DNA repair. They're involved in basically every hallmark of aging, pretty interesting genes. And another way to activate the sirtuins and other important genes like AMP kinase is to uh, administer NAD uh, which is um, a metabolite that, that builds up when you do caloric restriction. So it's a caloric restriction mimetic. Um, and this, you don't need to take pills yet, uh, or they're not available yet, but you don't need to take any pills. Uh, you can actually do caloric restriction. Intermittent fasting is what I do myself. So um, I, I uh, often ask this question to audiences, which monkey do you think is older? Take a second and look. Um, it's, it should be obvious within a couple seconds which one is apparently older, but it's actually a trick question uh, because they're the same age. It's just that the monkey on the left has undergone uh, some years of caloric restriction, uh, whereas the monkey on the right hasn't. The monkey on the left, uh, the video, he's actually running around. He's a little bit agitated, uh, but, uh, but he's so clearly younger. So, that, you, you know, when you see that with your own eyes, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty startling effect. Um, so I, I realize, you know, it's not all scientists on the call, so I won't get, you know, too in depth on the technicalities on this talk. Um, but just suffice to say that there are many different types of interventions that extend mouse lifespan. And uh, we expect that some amount of these are going to translate into humans. Um, so again, just uh, to summarize the hallmarks of aging are these different molecular mechanisms that cause aging. It is because of many decades of basic biomedical research that we understand these mechanisms of aging and that now only in the last couple of years has the uh, translational drug discovery community started to, to, to target these mechanisms. If you're curious about the science, um, I gave another talk a couple of years ago at Oxford as well um, on, on uh, the scientific details. You can look that up on YouTube, these uh, keywords here. Okay. So, um, for those non-scientists among us, but people who are interested in venture capital and entrepreneurship, uh, we can get into that section now. So you, you're probably mostly aware of how venture capital works. From the media, you probably have a slightly um, inaccurate uh, perception of it, uh, probably being more glamorous than it is. Uh, maybe I'll dispel some of those myths, uh, but uh, just simply about the mechanics. Um, VCs, they uh, invest in the startups of entrepreneurs. Um, but where do VCs get their money? They actually get the money from uh, what are called limited partners. So these are large pools of capital, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, uh, family offices. And they are entrusted with that money for about 10 years uh, to allocate into around 10 to 20 companies per fund. Uh, but then they have a limited, limited period of time to exit or sell their shares, their stock in those companies. Uh, so they partner with uh, investment banks, the public markets, uh, especially for tech companies, um, these sort of platform tech companies. But in biotech, 
Um, the majority of exits are actually M&A, so acquisitions by mostly big pharma, about 15 to 20 uh, big pharma names that acquire many of these assets. And they're acquiring these assets early and earlier and earlier in the clinical development uh, timeline um, for reasons we can get into later. Um, if you want to understand venture capital, uh, these books are great introductions. Um, I'd probably start with the run up one on the right, Venture Deals, and then uh, the Business of Venture Capital. Um, in this talk will be recorded, so uh, you can go watch this again if you, if you forget something that I said, or you can uh, take screenshots. So uh, the mechanics of venture funds, um, like I said, you have limited partners, and then you have general partners. General partners are the people who are employed by the fund, uh, and they actually allocate the capital. Um, and they need to diversify the portfolio into about 10 to 20 companies per fund. The compensation structure is two and 20, uh, quite like hedge funds. So 2% annual management fee, and then 20% of your returns, the carried interest. Um, that 20% return is after a hurdle rate, something like 8% uh, per year, uh, plus management fees. So you have to pay back your management fees. So if you have a hundred million dollar fund, and over a 10 year period, you know, that's 20 million bucks or say 15 million, you actually have to pay back that money uh, in addition to the hurdle rate before you as the GP actually see any of that carry yourself. So it's, it's a fairly high bar. Um, according to uh, Bruce Booth, uh, who has a really great blog uh, called uh, LifeSci VC, and he's a partner at Atlas Venture in Boston, uh, he described this so-called venture capital math problem in biotech which is you have an optimal fund size uh, between 200 and 500 million, let's say, for early stage biotech. Um, and the reason for that is because there are only so many big multi-billion dollar exits per year that you just can't get that necessary 3X plus return um, uh, with, with a, a very large fund. But of course, there's this perverse incentive in venture where GPs have an incentive to, ra to raise large funds and manage a lot of capital because they get paid off of the management fee. Um, and, and so, you know, that's a controversy in the field. So what are the roles in a venture fund? Uh, you have the uh, general partners and managing partners. Um, they usually put in a, a large chunk of their own money uh, into the fund to have skin in the game. You have junior partners uh, and principals, uh, venture partners and EIRs, whose goal is usually to build a new company. Um, associates and analysts, uh, more junior people, uh, often coming out of um, you know, uh, a couple of years of uh, work experience, uh, and then very important support functions, uh, legal, accounting, HR, executive assistants that are really necessary to make the fund move like a, um, a well-oiled machine. So 10 to 20 investments per fund, uh, about every five years, you can raise a new stacked fund if your, at least your paper gains uh, are, are attractive in your existing fund. Um, an interesting kind of provocative thing is that insider trading is kosher in private equity. Um, unlike if you're an investor in a public markets listed company, you are not allowed, you're not supposed to have any kind of information asymmetry over the public market. They need to publish all of the material information uh, about a company as it comes out. Um, but in private equity and venture, you have a board seat, you're speaking with management on a regular basis. Uh, maybe you are temporary, temporarily management. Uh, so you really have an incredible level of insight into the the day to day operations of the company. So that information asymmetry, coupled with something called a pro rata right, uh, allows you to double down on your successful investments and put more money into those investments that have been doing well, um, because many, many investments will actually fail. So uh, you need to be able to double down on the successes. Venture, biotech venture uh, is actually booming. These data are a little bit old when I collected uh, them, but um, it, it's, even, it's even bigger now. Um, many billions of dollars are flooding into uh, biotech, early stage uh, biotech and venture capital. Uh, so it's a good time to get in the field. Um, there's some controversy over whether it's a bubble uh, or whether we're at Irving Fisher's uh, permanently high plateau it, with respect to valuations, the amount of capital flooding into the space. Um, but on balance, I think it's a good thing to attract more attention. I think it's better to have more capital going into developing new medicines, say, than going into creating the next social media platform that is mostly just a distraction. Um, and uh, here's uh, uh, some data um, uh, more recently showing that um, 
there's a lot of mounting investment in the last couple of years, uh, about 15 billion uh, up until up until uh, September of this year. Uh, so we're we're really in you know sort of gangbuster uh, halcyon years of uh, biotech uh, funding. Um, I mentioned the exits, so. Um, VCs need to exit and all investors need to exit their uh, portfolio companies at some point. There are really two options. One uh, is a trade sale uh, and the other is a public offering. So there are pros and cons to each. So with a trade sale, there's no lockup period. When you list a company, there's usually a six month plus lockup period, sometimes not. Um, you don't have to do a roadshow, so you don't have to travel all around, you know, travel these days, but you don't have to do a lot of uh, presentations pitching your company. Um, you don't have to pay an investment banker fee or at least a reduced uh, fee. Um, you don't have to publicly disclose much about your company to competitors, including the IP. And it can be a much faster process. Uh, and you can also create a bidding war. Um, with an IPO, though, sometimes those are preferred um, if management wants to retain control of the company. Um, management gets to feel important and famous uh, and, uh, and they, they uh, feel prominent, although it's an exhausting process. Um, threatening to IPO and going through the motions of IPO uh, can actually incite a takeover offer. Um, and in a manic bull market, valuations tend to be higher than they would be in a trade sale. Uh, another advantage is that employees can uh, freely trade their sale, uh, freely uh, trade their shares, uh, and they're not forced to sell their shares, so they can hang on to them. Um, from a VC perspective, there's a bit of a drawback, which is um, when you list, when you register the securities to list publicly, your preferred stock, which carries certain rights and privileges, converts to common stock, um, and uh, and you know sometimes you have a liquidation preference and multiples, um, and uh, you lose that. Um, so this is actually uh, from Peter Kolchinsky, uh, this graphic at RA Capital, which is uh, a very prominent uh, investor in the space. And, uh, and he's got a lot of really uh, interesting, uh, innovative points about uh, the biomedical research system and, and ideas for how to improve it. And uh, he's come up with this one, uh, America's social contract for the industry. And basically the idea is, while many drugs have been their list price has been getting more and more expensive with time. Um, the, the difference between say um, the cost of other technologies uh, like Google and Facebook um, is that drugs go off patent, the patent eventually expires. And so he puts forth the idea that yes, we're paying a relatively high list price for these drugs for you know, 10, 20 years maybe, but eventually uh, they become che cheap as dirt. And it's almost like having a mortgage on a house where you, once you pay it off, society owns that molecule in perpetuity, um, sort of in a, a, as a commons. Uh, and so all of the generics drugs that, that we use today, uh, many of which are saving lives, um, were once quite expensive. So uh, it, it, it's certainly true that there is uh, a lot of sh unfortunate shenanigans going on in biopharma that that uh, sort of cast a shadow over the entire field. The majority of people in the field are quite altruistic and um, just generally good people, but there are certainly some bad actors operating. Um, and so we need to, like, for example, the insulin debacle, you know, insulin shouldn't cost what it does. Or, um, uh, you know, the Screlly saga uh, with Daraprim and, and just price gouging on drugs uh, isn't really acceptable. But, but there is something to be said for allowing relatively high cost for drugs to compensate for the high cost of, of R&D. Um, to play the devil's advocate on the flip side, uh, you could also make the case that R&D is expensive primarily because the pharmaceutical industry as a whole is not very efficient at getting drugs to market. So there's something called e Room's Law, which is the inverse of Moore's Law, which was coined by a friend named Jack Scannell, who also studied at Oxford Neuroscience. And he uh, published this in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery some years ago that under E-Room's law, it's becoming exponentially more expensive uh, to get a new drug approved. And there are various explanations for why that might be. It could be that all the low hanging fruit has been picked already. It could be that um, you know, the regulators are getting stricter. It could also just be that pharma is becoming a little bit more bureaucratic and, and less efficient. Um, and, and also the numbers that are coming forth from certain industry aligned think tanks like a Tufts uh, put the number at, you know, a billion dollars, two billion dollars to get a new drug approved. Um, that number isn't entirely accurate because it's 
it, it also accounts for the cost of capital um, as well as all of the failures. So if you, if you try to get 10 drugs uh, approved and only one of them gets approved um, and you've put you know, 100 million into each of those, you have lost 900 million uh, in that one drug with the hundred million dollars invested actually ends up paying off. So that actually, that billion dollar number accounts for all of the failures. So what that tells you perhaps is that pharma just is not very efficient at uh, R&D anymore. Um, and that could have been because of a lot of industry consolidation. And to their credit, pharma has recognized that they're not so good at early stage innovation. And so they have outsourced a lot of that and they're basically almost becoming like private equity funds with marketing operations attached uh, because they're just acquiring early stage assets, uh, many of which um, coming out of university. So you're in a good position as researchers to uh, develop a new medicines or, or understand the underlying biology. And you know, there's never been a better time to do a biotech startup. So anyway, um, here's a, another figure of my own. Um, not quite as pretty as Peter Kolchinsky's, uh, but uh, I, I think it gives you a nice overview of, of the, the dynamics. Um, I call this a wiring diagram, like in electrical engineering, but of the biomedical ecosystem. So um, the public is at the top here. That's not an accident because we're all the public and that's really who we have a duty to, um, we have a duty to the public because they fund the NIH or uh, the MRC and pretty much all basic biomedical research. Um, they also provide the risk capital through the public markets and through, through even private markets. Um, and that flows into venture capital, which flows into the biotech sector, spin outs from universities. Biotech and pharma do uh, transactions like licenses and acquisitions. Um, and pharma, as well as biotechs, as well as VCs, actually work a lot with CROs, contract research organizations, that have become a lot more sophisticated over the years. One of my personal favorites is Evotech, uh, but there are many proliferating. And Evotech, by the way, actually in part uh, started um, in Oxford. So the original Evotech was in Hamburg, where I also live. Um, but in Oxford, uh, there was a, a spin out from Steve Davies' lab called Oxford Asymmetry back in the day doing asymmetric synthesis. And uh, that was later acquired as the medicinal chemistry group of Evotech. So in uh, Abingdon, just down the road, they have a, a large facility there and a lot of really talented people. Um, so because of these uh, CROs proliferating, it's become a lot easier to um, just start with an idea and, and uh, do R&D virtually. These virtual biotech companies, you don't need your own lab space anymore. So this is a really incredible innovation that is almost analogous to the cloud computing um, revolution in, uh, in software and tech, which has dramatically reduced the cost of creating new companies. Before, you know, in the days of Hewlett Packard, uh, you would have to build your own server farm and you would have to, you would need a lot of infrastructure. Um, no long, that's no longer the case. And that's also becoming true with biotech. Um, and then, you know, working with uh, the CROs and pharmas, uh, you provide the data to the regulators. They take fees to review the data. They provide oversight to make sure there are minimal shenanigans um, and protect the public. Um, and payers, you know, health insurance companies uh, or the governments actually ultimately pay for everything. Uh, few people are paying out of pocket. Um, and that's part of the problem. And uh, the healthcare providers, of course, are the hospitals and, and clinicians who, uh, who decide who to prescribe to. So this gives you sort of an overview of, of the space for those who are not you know, in the biomedical community. So uh, bring a bit of levity. Uh, you you wanna be uh, an important business person. Uh, it's all about uh, being uh, fast on your feet here. Um, I like to kind of, uh, as the British say, take the piss out of uh, tech VCs. I have plenty of tech VC friends um, but uh, I like to sort of uh, belittle them a little bit relative to biotech. So um, venture is notoriously difficult to break into, especially biotech VC, because it's a smaller field and it requires more credentials and expertise than tech VC and a lot more capital. Um, so you need something around, depends a lot on the indication, but about 30 million bucks to get a drug from preclinical pre to phase two, oftentimes more than that. And it depends a lot on your geography, but around that. Um, whereas you can get a tech company to revenue for, I don't know, probably less than 10 million bucks. Um, you need more technical expertise. So, you know, for example, compare the expertise required to evaluate social media platforms, which we all have an intuitive understanding of at this point, to 
the fine details of immune oncology one day and then neuroscience the next. Um, graduate degrees are usually required. Uh, you need uh, a very strong network of connections with a more limited set of partners and acquirers, namely pharmas. Software companies can be a little bit more independent. They can generate revenue without a partner. They can bootstrap their operations more easily, but pretty much all biotechs sell uh, before they're anywhere near revenue. So as you can see, here's a dramatization of a picture of uh, somebody on, on the level of a biotech VC. Um, uh, and uh, over here, you have somebody who's a tech VC, for example, and you know they're pitching a new co. They say, oh, it's Tinder for your pet's laundry delivery, but built on the AI blockchain. It's a SaaS MVP that's almost ready, and it's only $700 million pre-money valuation, bro. Um, so uh, there, there are a lot of um, sort of... Uh, people entering into the tech investing space, uh, they, it, it probably won't end well for most of them, but they're kind of copying each other being like lemmings. Um, there are some counterexamples, prominent ones, uh, investors I like, uh, Steve Jurvetson, Peter Thiel, and the like, who invest in deep tech and they invest in stuff that uh, not everyone else is already doing. Um, and, uh, you know, part of, part of the argument coming from the Teal universe and Tyler Cowen is the technological stagnation hypothesis. Basically that, um, you know, to sum it up in a phrase, as Teal said, um, we wanted flying cars or we were promised flying cars and all we got was 120 characters referencing Twitter. Not to say there's much wrong with Twitter, um, but just that the rate of technological innovation that Teal and, and his uh, contemporaries were offered, you know, in the 70s and 60s, uh, in the sci-fi uh, that we would all be living like the, the Jetsons um, has not come to pass. And he basically said that, uh, you know, other than the screens, the, the, you know, phone screens and computer screens, uh, there's not really much that you would look around in a room uh, that would be very different from say the 1970s or 80s. Um, and that, you know, in American infrastructure, if you're traveling on the subway, it's so broken down and decrepit uh, that it's almost like the function of your phone and your social media uh, is actually to distract you. Uh, the consequences to distract you from how run down and uh, um, and old school all of the, the the physical aspects of the world are. Um, not the not the bytes and the information uh, economy, which has been growing rapidly, but actually the world of atoms, the world of physical things. Uh, has not been progressing as rapidly as, as we would have hoped. And that includes uh, the world of biotech. Although among the world of atoms, I think biotech is probably progressing at, at one of the most rapid paces. Anyway, so comparing private equity to venture capital. Technically, venture capital is a subtype of private equity, but when people say private equity, they're talking about something else. So you know the big names, KKR, Blackstone, Carlyle, et cetera. Um, it's, it's boring in my view. Um, they do a lot of financial engineering or creative accounting, uh, the use of leverage so they get paid for beta. Um, it's just a highly levered investment uh, in, in a relatively um, inefficient private market. Uh, so they do very well when interest rates are on the floor as they are today and when the economy is growing uh, as has been the case for the last 10 years or so. Um, but uh, but it's, it's, it's sort of a, a levered beta approach. Um, they do stuff like restructure a grocery store chain for synergies. Um, they consolidate companies to create monopolies. They're not really creating anything new in the world. It's a zero sum game. It's not zero to one, but one to N. Um, a lot of people are attracted to PE because it's prestigious in the finance world. They get higher base salaries uh, and they lose money less often than VCs do. But of course, VC, it's the highest calling of mankind. Um, it's pretty exciting. You have a sense of purpose. It's a zero to one. So you take something that didn't exist, but in, in someone's mind, some crazy professor out there, uh, and then you bring it into existence. So you're doing something that might not exist or at least not exist as soon, if not for your own personal efforts. Um, and the science is cutting edge. Uh, you're, you're learning new things usually before most of the world knows. Uh, suits are not required, uh, but of course, vests are mandatory. As you can see, I, I put on my, um, my official uh, vest for you, and I often make the joke, what does venture capital or what does VC stand for? It's not venture capital. It's actually vest community uh, because there's this meme that uh, VCs love to wear vests, and it's definitely true, especially in the Bay Area because it's, it's a little chilly there. Um, of course, in VC, you don't get paid quite as much as private equity. 
Um, so you live like a, a, a medieval serf uh, by their standards, but uh, that's good for virtue signaling anyway. Um, so what are the key skills of a biotech VC? This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but one, you need to be able to understand new bio areas of biology very quickly. So what that means is you spend most nights and weekends reading textbooks, papers, and pitch decks. Uh, you need to know the core foundations of drug discovery, pharmacology, toxicology, clinical development, and now new modalities like gene and cell therapy. Um, I'm very keen on this one. I actually minored in history in college. You need to know the history of drug discovery to try to predict where things are going to go. Um, you're investing on long time horizons, five, 10 years. Uh, and so you need to understand um, the sort of dynamics of, of the sector and know what's really new. Um, for the scientists on the call, uh, you'll need to brush up on finance, um, specifically the field of entrepreneurial finance and startup law. You need to be able to negotiate uh, term sheets. Uh, you want to do RNPV modeling, which I'll touch on, real options, uh, public market dynamics you need to understand, and also equity research. Um, in, in my experience, and probably yours as well, uh, is it's easier to learn the finance skills than it is to learn the science. The science is a lot more uh, technical and specific and just requires a lot more, you know, um, this sort of deep, hardcore uh, thought and memorization, whereas uh, the financial stuff you know, to know enough to be competent is, uh, is not as hard to learn. Another good one is to be uh, skilled at pitch deck design. This slide that you see before you is an example of what not to do. <laughs> it's just text heavy, but I, uh, I had to make this over the weekend. So uh, I apologize um, for its uh, lack of uh, polish. Um, the personal qualities that you want uh, in a VC, you have to be sociable. Um, so this is a relationship-based business like most of business, you need to be able to network hard for deal flow, recruiting into portfolio companies, finding partners for M&A, uh, syndication partners, uh, et cetera. Um, you need to communicate clearly to explain the merits of the science to non-experts. It sounds obvious, but this skill is rare. And that is what the CEO pay premium is all about. It's charisma. Um, so many people think that uh, they're good at communicating their science. A lot of professors think that, but they don't seem to realize what terms and what concepts their audience understands and what is important to their audience. So you have to have this sort of theory of mind, it's called. You have to put yourself in the shoes of others uh, to understand what, what is of interest to them. Um, you should be organized and conscientious. This is true of every job, uh, but uh, in particularly in VC, you'll have a lot of things going on at once. You need to stay on top of your schedule. Um, you kind of develop a sort of sense of ADD and you have to keep that ADD check. You also need a sterling bullshit detector. That's probably the main aspect of your job. Um, it's to find the skeletons in the closet. So the management teams, the founders will pitch you on the merits of the idea. They'll draw your attention to the good, attractive assets, aspects of the company. Uh, but you actually have to go find the skeletons in the closet during diligence. And a lot of VCs fail to do that. Um, and uh, you must like wearing vests, as I said. All right, so one question is, uh, what is a drug worth? Um, well, it's a complicated question. And uh, like a lot in finance um, and these models, uh, there's a lot of, it's, a, it's an art, not a science. Uh, but one useful um, model is uh, risk adjusted net present value, RNPV. And basically, um, as you, as you de-risk an asset, uh, you do more key experiments, you get clinical trial data, you're getting closer and closer to the revenue stage and approval. And so the level of risk declines um, and the net present value increases the closer you are to receiving that, that revenue. Um, so uh, for the non-financial people in the audience, there's an important concept of, of finance called the time value of money, and it plays into net present value. Um, so money received today is worth more than money in the future. Uh, why is that? Because of opportunity cost, in part. You can invest the money elsewhere, like in government bonds or another project. Not really bonds today, because they're paying zero or negative interest rates. Um, and that's part of the reason there's such a bubble across all financial assets, um, central bank uh, shenanigans. Um, and the other is inflation, which hasn't gone away. Um, this is the government's form of clandestine taxation, um, as uh, Friedman said. Uh, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. I don't know if that's so true, uh, but, uh, but in any case, uh, you need to account for, for that opportunity cost and that inflation. 
So uh, to give you an example, uh, you can use simple calculation using a discount rate when contemplating a project. So suppose you receive $100 million over seven year period. It's not worth $700 million. It's worth 700 million times the discount rate, um, which is 578 million. Uh, and then after that, you need to adjust for the risk that the project will fail, which is where the R and RNPV comes in. And so this is a super simple, superficial model I did some years ago for a um, Dutch investment bank uh, on a public company uh, doing something in aging. And uh, basically you, you take a bottom up approach. So you calculate the number of patients, uh, the probability that they're actually gonna be prescribed a drug, what you're gonna charge for the drug. And then you can have a sort of back of the envelope revenue model. Um, and then you need to uh, risk adjust it. So you actually risk adjust your R and D costs, your development costs, your expenses. You discount those because you don't know if you're actually gonna spend that money. Um, and then you, calculate what your near-term near milestones will be, your uh, revenue uh, from royalties, if you partner it out, uh, and, and the general sales. Uh, and then you come up with a number that is significantly less than the total aggr aggregate uh, revenues uh, discounted to the present. So in this case, it was 34 million bucks. Um, so VC is a profession. Why do it? Um, it's always exciting and new. You learn a lot from people at the top of their field. The base compensation is pretty good. 100K to 500K uh, plus the potential for carried interest or equity in companies that can be worth millions after some period of time. Um, carried, of it, carried interest is actually currently taxed as long-term capital gains, 20%. I'm biased, but I think that's actually a good thing. It should be that way. Maybe not for private equity funds, but for venture and entrepreneurship. And uh, the United States has qualified small business tax credits and, and uh, other incentives there. Um, it's prestigious. Uh, you get access to anyone because you might be able to give them money. Um, I've interacted with, you know, some of the most famous scientists in the aging space. That's been, you know, I have to pinch myself because, you know, I'm such a fanboy for that stuff. And, um, and it's really nice to be able to get pretty much anybody on the phone. Um, your risk is diversified across a lot of assets, unlike being a biotech founder where you're highly concentrated. That can be good if you're successful because you have greater upside, but being diversified is always a good thing. Um, it's, it's sometimes said that diversification is the only free lunch in finance. Some VCs such as later stage VCs don't actually work that hard if you're into that. Um, they get quite good at golf. Like Carl Icahn said, a lot of these guys are scratch golfers. Um, and uh, on the flip side, company builders, which is mostly what I've done over the last few years, uh, we work our tails off um, because not only do you need to build these companies uh, and operate them for a couple of years, but you also need to know all this stuff as a venture investor too. Um, the main reason, at least for me, is that you can influence the future of medicine. I can't really think of anything more exciting than that. Um, we will all be patients eventually if you haven't been already. Um, it's just uh, a fascinating vantage point on the biomedical research world. Some of the drawbacks. Um, you, you kind of have ADD forced upon you, attention deficit disorder. Um, it can be exhausting to switch tasks so often. You run out of mental energy some days, many days. Um, you have to have, you have to be comfortable with that kind of ADD lifestyle to deal with a lot of new info, info, info. Um, and, uh, the drawback is as a scientist, you're probably used to focusing on one topic for a long time. You don't really have that luxury in venture. Um, you have to wait a while for your big payday, 10 years plus, if it ever comes sometimes sooner. Um, most VC funds, this is a dirty little secret. They mostly fail to make the required return on investment about three X over the life of the fund cash on cash returns. Um, so the odds are that you won't actually surpass that and you won't get rich. Um, and, and if you don't surpass that, you're going to have a tough time raising your next fund. So you basically get one shot as a VC. Um, the legal work uh, and financing negotiations take a lot of time and energy and they're kind of boring. Uh, it's not as glamorous as uh, being in, engaged in the science. At the senior level, you have to commit your own money for one uh, and about 10 years to the firm for the life of the fund so, or 12 years. Um, so you get married to your investors and team. Uh, people will always be pitching you their ideas. Uh, that's fun at first, but it gets old. Um, many don't even look at your website to see, you know, what your investment mandate is. You know, we invest in therapeutics only. Um, and, you know, you'll have people coming at you with diagnostics or, you know, not even biotech stuff. It's, it's a little ridiculous. Um, the main drawback is that it's actually pretty high stakes. So you're entrusted with millions of dollars and, if you're sort of a conscientious person prone to anxiety, um, that's, that's a big burden to shoulder. Um, so 
Anyway, uh, there, there are a lot of different uh, funds out there. Uh, these are some of my favorites. Uh, they come in various flavors. So early stage investors, the heroes and visionaries, uh, some of which you'll probably have heard of, um, uh, some of which are company builders as well. Here are some of the more prominent longevity focused investors and company builders. Um, you have multi-stage funds that do it all. You have big pharma corporate venture funds, which are often evergreen structure um, that are getting very active. Um, and then you have late stage uh, Excel spreadsheet jockeys. Uh, he said with a tinge of jealousy at their Excel prowess um, and, uh, and they manage a lot of capital as well. And they're usually uh, not in for as long as long of a haul. Um, this is my own sort of personal uh, model or criteria for, for scouting Jira science innovation. This I made some years ago, it's a little out of date, um, but it focuses on three broad areas. So the pharmacology, the, the actual drug discovery aspect. So MOA of the drug, the target, if the target is known, um, the therapeutic index so the relationship between efficacy, potency, and toxicity, the classical pharmacology, um, more of the medicinal chemistry, synthetic chemistry, the chemical properties and ease of synthesis of the molecule, your cost of goods for manufacture, um, and uh, IP considerations uh, play into that. Then you have the geroscience aspect, which is a little bit unique about what we do. Um, the max median maximum lifespan extension is what we like to see. Um, the validation across various different model organisms, uh, yeast, worms, flies, fish, mice, uh, and, uh, and the, the degree to which the aging phenotype is actually reversed or attenuated. So is there improved physical function, cognitive function, tissue level improvements? Uh, what is the phenotype reversal? Um, which hallmark or hallmarks, because they're interconnected, are you targeting? And what is the potential for multimorbidity uh, to address multimorbidity? Um, will this drug work for multiple age-related diseases? Will it be a pipeline in the pill? And I'll get into that. Um, and that's one of the main pitches, one of the main really exciting aspects of geroscience is if you have a drug that slows aging, it's not just going to work for one disease like most drugs work for. It's going to work for many different diseases. So you can expand the label into various indications for which physicians can prescribe. Um, then you have the commercialization side. Uh, how translational is that lab? Um, have they spun out any companies or assets before? How did they do? The IP considerations, how strong is the IP? Uh, how patentable are, are the compounds? What's the chemical space around those compounds? Um, the track record of the lab, the publications, et cetera. All of that boils down into the translational attractiveness and we make an offer and we build a new code. Um, hate to sort of rain on the parade, but it's actually pretty difficult to transition from school at the undergrad or graduate level directly into VC. Can be done, uh, but usually people take a detour uh, into uh, one of the following areas. And uh, you should, by the way, read this uh, this book here, Entrepreneur's Guide to a Biotech Startup. It's a very quick read, uh, but it's very clear and well-written again for Peter Kolchinsky. Um, so one common area, especially in the Oxford ecosystem is to go to the city of London uh, or Wall Street, as we call it in America. Um, that can be the buy side at hedge funds and institutional investors. They kind of have to be correct. They have more of an incentive to be right about the bets that they place. Then you have the sell side, um, the equity research analysts and investment banks. They have a very high turnover, so a lot of people start there. Management consulting, so Kinsey, Bain, BCG uh, are big names, but you have a lot of uh, specialist biopharma consultants as well. Um, and wherever you are, uh, you want to try to spend most of your time working with pharma clients. I have some colleagues who, who, uh, who did that, and I think it really set them up well. Um, another good one uh, is to actually operate a biotech startup. So launching one out of uh, the university is quite difficult. Uh, you don't really have the sort of uh, gray hair and, and uh, legitimacy, uh, but uh, you can join a biotech startup. That's going to be the steepest learning curve, but probably the most valuable and relevant skill set. It doesn't pay as well as many of the other jobs, but, um, you know, you get paid in experience. Uh, another good one that's overlooked is technology transfer offices working there. This is a highly relevant skill set. I deal with them a lot. Um, more than I would like. And uh, you do a lot of licensing and, and other kinds of transactions. Uh, but the, the trouble is the incentive structure is perverse because the TTO officers, um, they're usually new to the field and uh, they don't have skin in the game and they're overburdened and they don't really understand the value of their, their assets very well. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, most TTO uh, offices are, are relatively um, disorganized, but, uh, but it's a good place to learn. Um, 
a lot of people also do pharma and, and BD roles. Uh, that uh, there are a few entry level roles there, but that's something to look into. Another good one, and I see they recruit, they used to recruit a lot at Oxford for this is patent law. Um, in the UK, it's actually harder to become a patent attorney. Uh, you have to pass a bunch of tests. In America, you don't. Uh, I mean, you pass one, but it's not as rigorous. Um, and these, this is a very useful and lucrative skill set to read, to understand, to be able to read a patent, the patent literature, to sort of get a sense of the value of a patent. Um, that's, uh, that's a really useful skill. Um, a lot of people ask, should I get an MBA or a CFA? I don't think that's entirely necessary. Um, and uh, financially doesn't often make sense in Europe. It's better because it's one year versus two years in the US um, uh, and, and can make sense if you're a scientist without that much uh, business uh, intuition. But again, a lot of those concepts taught in business school are relatively straightforward. You can learn them on your own time for much less money. Um, again, borrowing from RA Capital, they've done a lot of great work uh, and, and produced a lot of interesting graphics. Um, you can find this on their website, the career map. So it answers, what do you do with a background in biological science? So all of these different directions you can move into. And uh, one of those options is to go work at RA Capital. Um, so uh, here are some of the resources if you want to take a screenshot that I like in this space. Uh, so you have uh, biotech specific websites and, and news outlets, uh, some geroscience specific newsletters, um, some biotech podcasts, which I recommend because they're interviews, long form interviews with, uh, sorry, did somebody say something? I guess not. They're, we're almost done here. I've got two or three more slides. Um, these are long form interviews uh, with um, specialists in the field. So you can understand their career trajectory, what motivates them. Uh, that's, it's, it's really a good uh, source for insights. Geroscience journals. Uh, some of my favorites here, other key journals and drug discovery, not at all an exhaustive list. Some introductory tests, the texts which I recommend. Um, I have PDFs of most of all of these books. Uh, so if you want access to them, let me know. And I have a folder that contains a lot of these resources and many others that I'm happy to send you the link to. Um, so uh, I can talk about brain aging, but we're actually finishing up on time. So I'll just skip uh, skip through this. Um, sadly, I'll do another talk and you can, you can get into that at your leisure. Um, and I guess we can just finish with, um, finish with the conclusions here. So, uh, the prospects of longevity drugs are earth shatteringly important, kind of like the revolution in antibiotics in the early 20th century that changed the human condition. Uh, geroprotector drugs, I predict will do the same eventually. Um, as you guys know, uh, Howard Florey at Lincoln College, my college at Oxford, uh, sort of uh, was one of the pioneers in the development of penicillin for clinical use and uh, later won a Nobel Prize for that. And uh, prior to you know, the advent of chemical antibiotics, most of the biomedical field thought that such a thing would be impossible. You know, Paul Ehrlich's magic bullet, which was methylene blue, was one of the first indications of that, but most clinicians did not think that you could engage in what they called chemotherapy at the time for uh, antimicrobial drugs. And the sulfa antibiotics and then penicillin uh, really changed that paradigm and it was an absolute watershed moment. And you know, average life expectancy uh, dramatically increased. Most people at the time died of infectious disease. Now we die of age-related disease. Um, so, uh, so here you can see the structure of penicillin. That was a 20th century revolution, I predict, and many others predict that uh, the 21st century revolution will be geroprotective anti-aging drugs, um, such as rapamycin, you can see the structure here. And one of the companies that uh, my colleagues launched at Apollo um, is called Aovian Pharma, uh, that is developing new analogs of rapamycin that uh, are devoid of some of the side effects that would preclude its use as a, a long-term chronic uh, geroprotector. Um, one of the common questions, and I'll head that off at the pass, is how can we possibly do trials for longevity, humans live too long. Um, and that is absolutely true at present. Um, you don't need to use survival as your endpoint though for a geroprotective trial. Um, eventually, hopefully we'll have surrogate biomarkers such as the Horvath DNA methylation clock, which is highly accurate, uh, as well as simpler stuff, you know, blood biomarkers, chronic inflammation, frailty, grip strength, how quickly you can get up out of your chair, things like that as a composite endpoint. Um, but in the meantime, we don't even need to, um, uh, we don't really need to appeal to those. Um, we can 
simply do what pharma has been doing for decades, which is called label expansion or have a pipeline and a pill, which is you have one drug, you say you perhaps you show that it works for diabetes or cardiovascular disease or some rare disease. And then once it's on the market and it's in humans, um, you can expand the label with additional clinical trials into many other diseases. And with a pipeline and a pill that slows aging, you can expand that in theory into pretty much every age related disease. Uh, you just need to do it before the patent clock runs out um, or develop a new uh, formulation. So anyway, um, <laughs> to close, um, the uh, prospects for geroscience are very bright. And so, you know, my goal here, I will have succeeded today with the 80 or so or more on the call, uh, if you're still there, um, is to just convince a couple of you guys to commit your lives and careers to geroscience as I have done several years ago. Um, and uh, then, you know, I will have multiplied my efforts and maybe gotten some smarter, more competent people even uh, than I into the field. Uh, and even if you don't go into geroscience, the future of biotech itself is bright. Um, and it's a growing field. It's rapidly growing. I think it's a little bit bubblicious right now, but uh, I predict a day when people are going to be talking about biotech and new medicines as much as they're talking about, you know, the tech world today of selling advertisements in various ways. Um, because not only is there a lot of potential to make money as there is uh, in tech, but you can, you can do well by doing good, which means you can make a lot of money for your investors by actually improving uh, the human condition and human health. Uh, so I think biotech eventually, as the technology matures, it becomes more of an engineering discipline. Um, we're going to overtake uh, the tech scene in, in the prominence of uh, you know, the global investor and, and the everyday person. And it's often boiled down into this comment that this 21st century will be the century of biology. Last century was a century of physics and chemistry uh, becoming you know, engineering disciplines. And I think biology is, is approaching that, uh, that level pretty quickly. So, um, so we're up on time. I will uh, leave it at that and uh, take your questions. Okay, so uh, I see some questions in the chat. I guess I'll, uh, I'll read through them there. Do you think there will be a sig significant opportunities for retail investors in the longevity biotech sector or will biopharma giants acquire most of the successful longevity companies? Can big pharma incumbents be challenged? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of companies are staying private for longer, um, both in biotech and in tech and pharma pipelines are running dry. So they're acquiring these companies earlier and earlier. Um, so it, it's, it's becoming difficult for retail investors to participate in, in this growth um, in the public markets. However, there's a, a group that I work with called uh, Molecule and Molecule Exchange uh, that is trying to basically create a public market in early stage biotech assets, um, not just uh, companies, not just stock in companies, and they also want to tokenize that equity and, and put it on the blockchain, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but also IP coming out of universities, the sort of lifeblood of the industry, the, the patents and the data, and also to create a mechanism for crowdfunding that research to basically bring capital in earlier and earlier into the drug uh, discovery um, development pipeline than you know, just when they hit the public markets. So, um, so uh, will, will the biopharma giants acquire most of the successful longevity companies? Um, yeah, probably. Um, but, you know, with new platforms, like kind of like um, AngelList for biotech, like what Molecule Exchange aims to become, um, it may be possible for early stage retail investors to write small checks. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's long not really been early stage biotech hasn't really been the domain of retail investors because of its complexity anyway. Um, can big pharma incumbents be challenged? Well, they're already being challenged, um, which is good uh, because they're getting a little, they are a little sclerotic and bureaucratic. Um, a lot of great people in pharma, but it's just the incentive structure that doesn't work. So a lot of them are jumping ship into biotech and venture, uh, which is a great development, I think. Um, so yeah, they are being challenged. They do have to really bid up these early stage assets. Okay, uh, next question. Thanks, Nathan. Um, is the access to complete and organized patient data, biomarkers, pathologies, a problem to create clinical studies focusing on 
longevity? Um, not really. Uh, data, patient data is uh, becoming more and more accessible, especially in countries like Denmark and the UK, which have, uh, you know, government sort of scary big brotherish statist um, data collection uh, procedures. Um, so you can actually get pretty good data uh, these days, and a lot of private uh, CROs have that kind of data as well. Um, so, uh, so no, that's that's not really the main problem uh, with longevity. Um, we don't really have to do much. We don't have to change much about the drug discovery process uh, to do longevity drugs. All we need to do is follow that same pathway and then do label expansion. So we take a drug that works for say diabetes or heart disease, and we show that it also works for cancer or it also works for X, Y, Z, um, as has been shown with metformin and rapamycin and, and a number of other longevity drugs. So I'm just gonna get through the questions as they're written and then people who've raised their hands uh, will come to you. And, and you can type in your question there too, just if you wanna get your place in line, but I see you. <laughs> um, okay, couple questions. What has been the impact on valuations as pharma companies assume more risk and acquire companies earlier in the drug development process? Um, as you would expect, early stage valuations go up. Uh, how do clinical trials with humans work given the long timelines to measure the long-term effects? Uh, that's, a, that's a fundamental problem with clinical trials. Um, you're supposed to do uh, phase four clinical trials or post-market surveillance. And then you know, whole departments do epidemiology and sort of post hoc analysis. Um, so, you know, that's how we found out that metformin actually extends uh, lifespan in diabetics, even despite their diabetes, beyond that of age-matched non-diabetic controls, which is an incredible finding. If that is reproducible, and it was actually a very large study in the UK, so I suspect it is, um, that's a pretty amazing result. And so those kind of post hoc analyses will come out. The question with metformin, I'm a little bit of a metformin skeptic among the geroscience community. Um, because it's, you know, 5% lifespan extension in mice and you have to get the dose perfect. It's a U-shaped curve. It becomes toxic with too much because it's a mitochondrial uh, cytochrome C inhibitor. Uh, so it's a mitochondrial toxin. A little bit of poison is good for you, like hormesis, but too much is probably bad. And then the other question is, is metformin good for people who are metabolically generally healthy or is it only fulfilling some deficit, solving some problem in diabetics? And it would actually be deleterious to people who are metabolically healthy. And there's some evidence mounting of that. Um, okay. You mentioned that there are current, you're currently doing intermittent fasting. What other life extension methods are you personally using? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> I do, I do a lot of stuff. Um, you know, uh, drinking the blood of, uh, of, uh, innocent, uh, you know, uh, infants is probably the most effective one, but you know, not everyone can afford that, uh, or, or has access to Craigslist, but, um, <laughs> no, I take a lot of supplements. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these have really strong evidence. You know, I'll give you one example. It's, uh, it's actually, I'm here in San Diego right now at the moment in sunny San Diego. And uh, there's a group here at the Salk who I'm talking to who has a drug um, that is an analog of physetin, which is a polyphenol found in strawberries and other plants. And it's been shown that this molecule extends lifespan by 15% in mice with no side effects. Um, so that's almost as good or about as, as good as rapamycin, but without the side effects. And I, I've come across a couple other uh, drugs like that since. Uh, so I take Fizetin, um, and I take daily multivitamin. I take, I have, sh I have a shelf full of supplements, you know, fish oil. I, I take all kinds of stuff. So, um, I can, I can, I actually have a document. People ask me this and I have a written document explaining which ones I take and why. So if you're curious, send me a message on LinkedIn and I'll forward that to you. Um, but yeah, exercise and caloric restriction uh, are the most important. Also getting high quality sleep, easier said than done, but that's a really big one. Kind of all the stuff that your grandmother uh, would tell you to do. Um, any black market research insights? That's a, uh, that's a very provocative question, Caleb. <laughs> I, don't, I don't exactly understand, but I like it. Uh, where are you going with that? Um, well, one, one example I can give is uh, with Clara Biotech, um, the, the Dutch Senolytics company we, we built uh, targeting FOXO4, um, which is a senolytic kind of like Unity's molecules, but without the toxic side effects, and you could administer it systemically into just instead of just the joints in the eye that they're limited to. Um, we we had accounts of, and we didn't encourage this. We had accounts of people on uh, forums, message boards, people contacting us, trying to purchase that peptide, um, and and actually synthesizing the peptides themselves with CROs and injecting it into themselves. And I actually met one guy who who did it at a conference, and you know he he survived. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. You know, we do clinical trials for a reason. Um, 
clinical trials are, are sort of a rigorous uh, epistemology, you know, a way that we can know whether something really works. I mean, it's just the scientific method. Um, so I would, I would wait until the clinical data come out uh, before taking any kind of risk. Um, but uh, hopefully that answers your sort of black market uh, question. Um, uh, how do you give enough about your idea when pitching without giving away all the steps to get scooped? Um, so a lot of people in uh, the startup world uh, are very um, sort of touchy and secretive, more secretive than they need to be. Um, ideas are cheap. There are many ideas. Execution is the hard part. Um, and you have to stick with something for a long time. Uh, and so pretty much the only thing that you really shouldn't disclose um, is the chemical structure of an unpatented molecule. So because if, if a chemist sees that, you know, they'll memorize it and they'll file the patent. Uh, so once you filed your patent, you can be, you know, it becomes public after about a year uh, in most jurisdictions. So then, then you're pretty much okay. Everything else is relatively kosher to speak freely about. And in this talk, I haven't disclosed anything uh, very sensitive, but uh, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry, but most people are a little bit too secretive than they need to be. Um, and I think, I think the world benefits from a little bit more of an open source uh, sharing type perspective. And, uh, and also as an investor, right? I mean, if, if a, a company pitches me and they're cagey about some important information and I have to like sign a CDA and I have to send them a bunch of emails and they're like hesitant to tell me stuff, it just slows down the process. So my style is to be very upfront about stuff. The only thing that I won't disclose are like key secret sauce, patentable information. Um, okay, next question. What is the breakdown of where your deal flow comes from? Okay, that's a, that's a good one. Um, they're, they've all been good ones, but that's a particularly interesting one. Uh, so uh, a lot of my deal flow, surprisingly, has uh, come through uh, word of mouth, um, just because, you know, as we sort of gain a reputation in the space, people send stuff inbound. Um, but a lot of it has also, maybe somewhat as a surprise, just come from the scientific literature. Um, it's kind of amazing that, you know, you'll see these incredible publications, they're reproducible, they're coming from great labs, you know, their pharma should be all over this. And what I've learned over the years is pharma is actually pretty slow on the uptake. They don't have that many people out there doing BD and licensing, searching, search and evaluation, and they're looking for very specific niche things. Um, so there's just a huge amount of opportunity of science and early stage assets out there that are not being addressed by pharma. And if you're not at one of the you know, most prominent institutions you know, in Boston, San Francisco, some in San Diego, New York, you're just kind of getting ignored a lot of the time by by pharma uh, and, and even VCs. And, you know, there are there may be a dozen or two dozen company building VCs, too. So there's just so much substrate. There's so much science out there that uh, we just can't really we can't really churn through it fast enough. Um, so a lot comes from the literature. Some comes from conferences um, and uh, word of mouth. And uh, yeah, that kind of thing. That's where it usually comes from. Um, how bias? No aging cell. Oh, aging cell was up there. Should have been up there. Uh, aging cell is is uh, I, I quite like that journal. That's one of the flagship uh, aging journals. It's not actually a cell press journal though. You'll notice that was a, a nice trick. Uh, you know, I have I I'm I co-founded a company with some people who launched um, a journal of their own called Microbial Cell, and they consciously did they called it that so that they could easily sell it to Cell Press eventually, which is one of the more prestigious publishers of. Uh, uh, biomedical uh, research. So, so yeah, aging cell was there. Should have been up there. Um, next question: What happens to the animal models at the end of their life after healthy life extension? Fast decline or normal decline? Yeah, um, it depends on the type of intervention. Uh, if you genetically engineer the mice, say to have a FOXO3 gain of function, uh, which is one of the key longevity genes in humans, um, uh, found in super centenarians, long-lived people. Uh, it's a transcription factor that regulates a whole lot of hallmarks of aging. Um, they live very long time in good health, uh, and then they decline relatively quickly, which is what you want, right? You want to square that mortality curve, as the NIH calls it, square the mortality curve. You don't want a slow, painful decline. You want to live very long, healthy life, and then boom, you're done. Um, and maybe eventually we'll do that through euthanasia. Um, so anyway, uh, but, but for some other interventions, it's a relatively slow decline. Um, 
you know, like drugs that basically chemotherapeutics, for example, a lot of mice die from cancer. M mice mostly die from cancer. I think it's 80% cancer um, for a lot of reasons. And uh, those drugs, you can extend the lifespan of mice by giving them a drug that addresses the pro proliferation problem, the tumor burden, but uh, usually their quality of life is not very good. So if you're actually targeting the hallmarks of aging, like autophagy enhancement, they live longer and better health um, and then decline fairly rapidly. All right. Um, shame the bit on brain aging had to be skipped. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that, Katerina. It doesn't have to be, but I don't want to keep you for more than an hour. I'm happy to talk about it. And uh, I think I have some time after this. So those of you who are not neuroscientists or scientists, uh, you're more than welcome to drop off the call. Uh, I won't be um, offended. But if for those diehards who are curious, um, I can get into that. I think I have 30 slides or so. so and uh, that's some of my more controversial stuff. Uh, I really like uh, controversy. So I'm pushing the envelope. So, so I can get into that uh, in a minute. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Make Jack the host again. All right. Let me see how I do that. Um, participants. Just a sec, guys. Jack. All right. How do I make you the host? Make host. Boom. Change host. Okay, good. So Jack's the host now. Hopefully, uh, Hopefully that worked. All right. Finishing up on questions, uh, Tomas wanted to ask something. Maybe if you could just type the question, that would be uh, helpful. Um, Olaf, what is, is, in your mind is the biggest constraint to making progress in life extension? Money, talent, ideas, something else. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, we could use more of all of it. Um, money in the last five years has kind of been flooding into the space, not nearly as fast as it should be, but probably in that period about maybe about a billion dollars has come into the space in various forms. Uh, so that's moving in the, in the right direction. Talent is a big one. So probably the rate limiting step for company formation is getting qualified biotech operators who uh, also are really excited about aging and hiring them and recruiting them away from whatever they're currently doing in pharma. I've managed to do it a bunch of times. Um, surprise, it's easier than I would have expected because people are looking to jump ship from pharma. Um, and people are excited about aging. But uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the rate limiting step is actually operating talent. Um, ideas, no, there are a lot of ideas. There's a lot of sort of back, uh, you know, accumulate a backlog of substrate that we just haven't gotten to yet. Uh, there are plenty of ideas. Um, general awareness, uh, you know, the public is very keen on aging and anti-aging, which I don't use the term. Uh, we try not to use the term anti-aging because it's been sort of corrupted by the charlatanism of people who inject stuff into your face or hormone replacement and stuff, which, you know, has its merits, but it's not really truly anti-aging per se. So we've actually switched this term of geroscience or longevity biotech to kind of distinguish ourselves from, from those types of people, um, some of which may, may prove to work, but a lot of it is, you know, iffy. Uh, okay, another from Caleb. What percentage of uh, biotech VC capital is actually going into geroscience related efforts? Rough guess. Very little. Um, you know, if it's say it's 20 billion a year into biopharma early stage venture, um, maybe 50, 100 million a year in recent years is going into geroscience. So, and then here's another depressing statistic the NIH uh, has about a $45 billion a year budget. Um, I think a large majority of that is wasted, uh, but um, setting that aside, um, there's one institute called the National Institute on Aging that funds most of the basic research on aging. Their budget, I think, is three or four billion a year. Um, about a billion of that goes just to Alzheimer's, um, and uh, about a billion of that goes to like kind of social sciences research, this kind of stuff like, all right, so what should we call old people? Should we call them aged? Should we call them elderly? Should we call them wizened, mature? whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's going to move the needle. I don't think we should be investing in that kind of stuff. We need to be investing in drug discovery and the basic research. And by some estimates, it's only about $100 million a year from the NIH that goes into the hardcore geroscience, basic biology of aging. And there are maybe one to 200, maybe 300 labs really consciously focusing on geroscience in the whole world. So, um, so yeah, we need more, we need more, uh, um, research funding money going into the basic research. Right. Uh, Patrick asks, why do you think major pivotal human trials of existing drugs like TAME and metformin, TAME is 
targeting aging with metformin led by Nir Barzilai. We're going to get involved in that. It's an interesting idea. Um, why the TAME study with metformin to assess uh, whether metformin extends healthy lifespan in humans? Um, so difficult to fund. From the position of a hypothetical investor, I would have thought a successful readout would increase the expected value of one's entire portfolio, even if metformin itself isn't profitable. Good point. That's why at Cambrian, um, my colleague James, um, you know, was in discussions to to help shepherd forward the tame trial because it hit some roadblocks, and uh, you know we have some investor connections that maybe we could have expedited it. FDA already cleared it as a study to do, and they wouldn't use uh, mortality as the endpoint. They were going to use the latency between uh, morbidity, so you get sick with one thing, and then you, how long does it take before you get sick with something else? When you get sick with one disease, um, that weakens your constitution such that you're gonna get sick with something else at some point shortly thereafter. So if you can extend that latency period, that's sort of a, a, a surrogate uh, uh, underlying latent variable for the pace of aging itself. Um, so, so yeah, TAME has uh, hit, hit some trouble. And you know they also wanted to spend a lot of money on biomarkers and they wanted to make it a lot more expensive with all the bells and whistles and need to be. I'm a big fan of minimum viable products, right? You just, you hit the key milestones with as least money as you can and uh, go from there. Um, they didn't take that approach with TAME. They wanted to do everything in the kitchen sink. So maybe they'll reduce their costs a little bit and get started earlier. And yeah, when you do have that proof of principle, if, that, if it works, um, then it would be a watershed moment for the field. But it, it, we're not going to require TAME necessarily. I, I would actually bet on some other molecules that are uh, safer than metformin. Metformin is very safe as far as drugs go, but it's not as safe as a lot of other stuff. Fizetin, spermidine, uh, a bunch of uh, polyphenols out there that extend lifespan that would probably have a similar effect. Um, right. So the, uh, let's see, next. Absolutely committed. Uh, Michael Hudson, uh, Biomedical Science. Fantastic talk. Thank you, Michael. Lopez, our team gave us nine brilliant hallmarks. In relation to brain aging, are you seeing the many startups focusing on the extracellular matrix? Or is this a potentially overlooked hallmark? Good question. Um, we actually did launch a company targeting the ECM. It's still in stealth mode. Uh, it's actually a spin out of a UK university. Um, ECM was sort of overlooked by uh, the hallmark of aging authors to some extent. Um, and it wasn't just Lopez Otin, it was, you know, his whole, his whole crew. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I am partial to looking at advanced glycation end products and these other extracellular modifications that definitely enhance inflammation. Um, it's not a stretch for me to imagine that targeting the ECM will improve uh, health. However, the definitive study has not been done. To my knowledge, there's no study in which you intervene in some extracellular matrix component and extend lifespan across species, uh, such as mice. There's, there's some circumstantial evidence in C. elegans, Colin Ewald's lab. Um, there's some evidence from Vera Gorbanova's lab uh, related to hyaluronic acid and hyaluronidase inhibition in naked mole rats, which live a really long time. Uh, but uh, you know, for me, we're still early days there, but you know, we think there's enough circumstantial evidence that it's worth a shot. Um, so, so we actually did fund a project uh, to do some medchem on, uh, on, on an ECM target across linking target. So yeah, good question. Um, and also, by the way, I should say, Aubrey de Grey is speaking, I think next week. Um, uh, he's uh, he's a, a very insightful character, very smart guy. And he actually kind of predated the hallmarks a little bit with his seven deadly sends the strategies for engineered negligible senescence, his SENS foundation. He was early to the game, brought along Peter Thiel and a bunch of other prominent thinkers. And uh, Aubrey actually got me into the field originally. I read his book, Ending Aging. It was in high school, uh, started doing biomedical research. I got an internship at the Buck Institute, uh, paid for by Aubrey and Thiel's money. So uh, I owe Aubrey a lot and uh, he's done a huge service to the field. He's a little more optimistic and a little bit more provocative than I probably would be, uh, but he's, he's gotten a lot of attention in the field as have people like David Sinclair, another very smart guy. Right. Um, Leopold said, you'd like to ask some questions. If you can type your questions, that's a little bit better, Leopold, just so I understand and it's a little faster. Caleb, any sense of the current longevity industry progress in Singapore and China? Um, China, not really. Um, I don't know that much about China. Uh, I mean, there is, there is some aging research going on in China. I'm just not familiar with biotech startups uh, in China yet. Um, 
But Singapore, um, there's a gentleman there, Brian Kennedy, uh, one of the early uh, pioneers in the field of sirtuins and caloric restriction. And he actually was running the Buck Institute when I was there. Now he's the head of some department at the National Univer University of Singapore, very good school, um, doing aging research and interacting with the Singaporean government to try to facilitate geroscience in that country. And Singapore is a very forward thinking uh, type of place. And so, you know, I, I've often said that it's not going to be the EMA or uh, the FDA that um, a, a grant approval for the first gero protectors and allow doctors to prescribe drugs for aging or as a prophylactic against uh, certain age related disease diseases. Um, it's probably going to be a, an Asian regulator because they have older populations and they've shown a willingness to be a little bit more entrepreneurial and um, think outside the box. So like Japan is a world leader in stem cell biology in part because Shinya Yamanaka uh, was you know, at Gladstone in Kyoto and he won Nobel prize for induced pluripotency uh, with John Gurdon in the UK. Um, and so at that other place, I can't remember the name starts with a C. And, um, and so there are a lot of forward thinking regulators uh, in Asia and um, Asia has a long tradition of longevity. So in Ayurveda, in India, the Indian system of medicine where we've gotten a whole lot of interesting drugs, um, they Ayurveda means you know the study of life, and uh, they have a subtype, a subdiscipline, which is uh, called Rasayana, which are substances and practices that extend healthy lifespan. And so you know there are like fifty or hundred substances out there, some of which you know probably um, that are taken to extend healthy lifespan. Um, and then traditional Chinese medicine has the superior class herbs, uh, and have also given us a lot of drugs over the years. These natural product derived drugs, including artemisinin, which has probably saved more lives than almost any other drug known, which became the basic scaffold for malaria drug, the most effective malaria drugs, artemisinin, came from the traditional Chinese medical pharmacopoeia, their armamentarium of, of drugs. Um, so, so I think they're a little more receptive to, to longevity, uh, and they're a relatively long-lived po population as it is in Japan. So, um, so yeah, I'm pretty sanguine about the prospects of um, longevity in Asia, but it's, I'm, my hands are so full with us and Europe that I just, you know, leave Asia to somebody else, uh, at the moment, but, but yeah, um, I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, how much of an impact do you think will gene editing technologies have on extending lifespan? All right. Um, over the long, long term, probably a pretty huge effect, probably the largest effect size possible, but I emphasize over the long term. CRISPR, as we're seeing now, is a rather inaccurate editor. Um, it, somebody just published that it causes a uh, loss of entire chromosomes at times. Um, yeah, that's not ready for prime time. In the meantime, we can do embryo selection, uh, where you fertilize an embryo, grow to 100 cell stage, take a couple cells, sequence it, and the algorithms are getting better at predicting uh, not only longevity, but stuff like intelligence, uh, other disease risk, uh, it, you name it. Um, we're not a tabula rasa, we're not a blank slate. A lot of our identities and behaviors and health risks are genetically encoded for better or worse. So, so I think there will be massive, massive um, effects once we can actually accurately edit uh, the genome. Sadly, we're a, adult developed humans already. We can't benefit from embryonic engineering, but gene therapy is advancing. A gene therapy is still quite medieval and rudimentary. You know, if you inject an AAV, it really doesn't get into enough cells to really make a difference in most tissues or whole body. It gets into the liver really well or certain tissues you directly inject in, but we really can't, we really can't access most of, most of the body uh, with gene therapy today. Also a shout out for cell therapy, um, some really interesting results uh, in animals, but the main problem that's dog cell therapy, in addition to the manufacturing costs, um, you know, it's logistically very difficult to have a standardized pr uh, product uh, that is a cell therapy, like for example, Novartis is losing money on Kimriah, their T cell therapy and Gilead probably as well. Um, so, uh, so gene and cell therapy, I'm very optimistic about, but it's, it's going to probably take longer than expected. Um, and that's why I focused on small molecules primarily as most drugs have been small molecules and it's relatively cheap to actually develop a small molecule into the clinic, um, antibodies, peptides, uh, you know, known biologics that have been more sort of proven out as modalities. Okay, Jason said, from an, as an undergrad studying an unrelated major, computer science, 
Um, how would you recommend getting into the field of biotech? Okay, good. I'm glad to have converts from even outside of the biology space. Uh, you're probably a, a smart cookie doing CS, uh, so, uh, so we're happy to have you. Um, well, bioinformatics is a very important and growing field, and we're getting these huge data sets, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and sifting through the data using AI, ML to you know, tease out uh, insights is, is a very hot area. Uh, and you don't need to know that much biology to get into bioinformatics. Um, and you know, compared to probably what you're, what you're doing um, in other disciplines, it's probably like scripting or script kitties by comparison, as you would say. So, um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend getting into it. It pays pretty well, maybe not as well as being an AI person at Google, but alas, Google and a lot of the tech companies like Amazon, for example, uh, are getting into healthcare. So, um, so that's, uh, that's an option. Um, so yeah, happy to have you join the fray. All right, Murray asks, what's your opinion on partial epigenetic reprogramming? How do you think it holds, do you think it holds any real promise? Um, to be careful what I say here. <laughs> uh, I'm a fan. Um, I don't think we can do it in vivo uh, anytime soon. So, you know, there was the uh, Ocampo paper uh, from uh, out of the Salk actually down the street here, um, finding that if you uh, conditionally temporarily overexpress some of the Yamanaka factors, not including MYC, you actually get rejuvenation on the tissue level of some tissues, but you have to get the dose perfectly right. Otherwise you cause type of tumor called a teratoma. Um, so in vivo is risky, uh, and, and you know there are controversy with that paper. But I actually know the the first author, who's now a professor in Lausanne in Switzerland, and what he's doing is actually screening for small molecules that will recapitulate some of those effects without any kind of oncogenic transformation risk. And a lot of groups out there, um, one good one is Sheng Ding uh, at Gladstone, who are also screening for small molecules to rejuvenate cells ex vivo. So um, we also have a project within Cambrian where we are able to um, rejuvenate, uh, or we hope to be able to rejuvenate various types of cells ex vivo, uh, such as T cells or hematopoietic stem cells, and then re-implant them back into the same patient um, and, uh, and rejuvenate uh, them that way without any kind of risk of transformation by administering whole body. So I'm optimistic about it, but I think it's a little overhyped. You know, it's the, the hype cycle. Um, and uh, eventually I think it could be really interesting. Um, and we also know that aging is epigenetically encoded, right? Because when you do the Yamanaka transformation, pretty much all of the biomarkers, the cellular markers of age, biological age are wiped away in cells. There's still DNA damage that accumulated, mutations that accumulated, but the epigenetic marks are younger, proteostasis uh, is back in action. The cells look totally rejuvenated when you bring them back to that embryonic like state. So, um, so I'm, I'm very optimistic, but I think again, it'll take a while. Jessica asks, concerning your extensive experience with the space, what do you think will be the first thing to hit the market? Which area in your opinion has so far not been explored much considering the focus on modulators of sirtuins, for example? Yeah, sirtuins have gotten a lot of uh, airtime um, and you know, deservedly so because they're, they're quite important in mediating the benefits of caloric restriction. And DNA repair, and you know, there's seven mammalian sirtuins, and you know, you know, that's uh, seven seven times the fun. Um, but uh, but they're they're a little overhyped, probably. Um, actually, at this they were overhyped. At this point, they're they're underhyped. You know, like a true value investor, they're they're a little bit hated because of controversy over what happened with Sirtris, which I come to find out is unjustified controversy. It was legit, um, and we actually funded or in the process of negotiating a, a company targeting one of the sirtuins. I won't say which yet. Um, so areas that are underexplored, mm, that's a, a big question. I'd have to think a lot about that. Um, one that I can get on into, um, if, if people are interested, uh, when I talk about the neuroscience aspect, the brain aging aspect in some of the slides that I'll pull up in a bit, um, is actually, uh, the gut brain axis. Um, so Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, as well as Eli Mechnikov, a Nobel prize winning immunologist who kind of pioneered the field of immunology in Russia or Ukraine. Uh, they both agree that death begins in the gut, I think is the way that Hippocrates said it. Um, and uh, Ayurveda believes the same thing, that um, maintaining the strength and function of the gastrointestinal system, digestive system is really critical uh, in, in often one of the first things to go wrong, one of the weakest links in aging. And I saw this myself, you know, when we created accelerated uh, zebrafish models 
of telomere dysfunction, telomere attrition, we saw that the gut was the first tissue to go because the gut is most proliferative. So it's most reliant on telomerase. Anyway, so, um, so ways of enhancing gut barrier function, enhancing the function of the GI system, I think is, is a pretty good area and it's relatively unglamorous, ha hasn't gotten that much attention. Um, I should just note that oncology gets about 50% of all research dollars in biotech. And oncology is not the leading cause of death. It's the second leading cause of death. Uh, and it's, it's trailing fairly far behind cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease in the modern world is mostly caused by our bad diet and lifestyle, metabolic syndrome and stress, et cetera. Um, so you have to wonder if cardiovascular disease is by far the leading cause of death, I think it's half a million people in the US or so, a year, stroke and heart attacks, why, why, is, why isn't that getting the most R&D dollars? Is there something unattractive about cardiovascular disease as a commercial perspective, from a commercial perspective, or something particularly attractive about oncology? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Part of it is that the standards, the regulatory standards for getting a, an oncology drug approved are lower. So there's a lower bar for toxicity. You can have a toxic chemo drug, and they don't look often at overall survival and life, lifespan extension in cancer patients. They look at, um, uh, what is it called? Um, I can't remember the term, but basically tumor shrinkage and uh, reduced rate of progression. And, and that's enough to be approvable. And then you can charge a hundred grand a year for a new kinase inhibitor. Um, and you know, voila, uh, you don't have to work that hard as a pharma company. You just keep picking the low hanging fruit. And you know, there's this argument that pharma often makes, pharma lobbyists make, which is, oh, you need to relax your regulatory standards and make it easier to get drug, drugs approved. In some areas I agree, but in some areas I don't. And if you raise the bar and you said, we're only going to approve drugs that meet this higher bar, pharma will be forced and biotech will be forced to meet that challenge. Um, and there are a lot of smart people in the field that can be done, uh, but they don't because they go for the lower hanging stuff that's more likely to work in the near term and will be profitable and so on. And they don't even know what will be profitable a priori. So to give you an example, Novartis is one of my favorite pharma companies. Um, they spend the most along with Roche, both Swiss, Swiss giants spend the most on R&D of any pharma. They spend about 15% of every dollar of revenue on R&D. But uh, they also spend about 30% of every revenue dollar on marketing. <laughs> so they spend double on advertising basically and you know trying to convince doctors and so on than they do on R&D. And most of that R&D budget goes to late stage clinical trials. It doesn't go to research anymore, it goes to development. So um, even for, for Novartis, uh, one of the most innovative pharmas, um, they, they aren't piling that much into R&D. And even when they do, they can't really predict what's gonna work. So one of their best successes, uh, this drug called Imatinib or Gleevec uh, around 2001, um, was hailed as this revolutionary new type of drug and new paradigm for drug discovery, targeted therapy and oncology, uh, where there's a magic bullet for every mutation. And, you know, it was on Time Magazine. Um, and basically this drug Imatinib works for the BCL ABLE translocation, Philadelphia chromosome and CML. And it's a pretty rare type of uh, leukemia, uh, but, uh, but this drug actually pretty much cures it, you know, 90% plus cure rate. And uh, the development of resistance is relatively rare. Um, and so this was a huge success. Uh, and it was actually, even though it's a rare indication, it's, it was a commercial success too. And it really burnished the reputation of Novartis and also opened the door to this targeted therapy approach. Um, the funny thing about that, and this is true across uh, therapeutic areas, is pharmas are really bad at predicting what drugs are, what, how much, you know, how productive uh, or you know, how much revenue they're gonna get from a drug. So the marketing team at Novartis in Switzerland, in Basel, almost killed imatinib. They, they said there aren't enough patients let's not develop this drug. And cooler heads prevailed. Some scientists championed it as often happen, has to happen in pharma to champion it, to make sure it continues. And uh, lo and behold, it, it worked out well. And this, you know, this is true for pretty much every major breakthrough, like the checkpoint inhibitors, CTLA, Jim, Jim Allison, CTLA-4. Um, he was pounding, there's a documentary on this, which I recommend, it's called Breakthrough, really good documentary, um, in which he was, you know, pounding the pavement, trying to get the attention of pharmas to get into uh, CTLA-4 and checkpoint inhibitors, which we now know today are the hottest area of all of pharma um, and immune oncology. Um, 
uh, the PD-1 inhibitor, CTLA-4 inhibitors, uh, antibodies. And, uh, and so he couldn't get their attention. And so it required this small biotech, Metarex, to advance it. I think somebody from Metarex spoke recently at Oxford. I couldn't make the talk, but, uh, but looked like a good one. Um, and, you know, this is a classic story is that, you know, the, the game changing innovation is not recognized by pharma because they're, you know, they're just, you know, set in their ways and blinkered and bureaucratic and they don't want to take any risk. Uh, and then all of a sudden some farm, some biotech company shows that it, it really works really well. And then they all have to scramble to get into the space. And that's when you get $10 billion exits in a company because everyone sees the, the merits of it and they're behind. Um, same thing happened with uh, hepatitis C. Solvaldi, Harvoni, um, you know, there's this mad dash for um, curative therapies for hepatitis C. And that's another recent, we don't have a lot of these really effective therapies in pharma um, out, outside of uh, anti-infectives. But now we have curative, a curative therapy for hepatitis C, which is huge, you know, amazing, amazing innovation. I'm usually very critical of the industry, but this is a case where it really worked out, you know, for everybody concerned. They, you know, Gilead got in a little bit of hot water for charging a lot of money and GSK for charging a lot of money. Um, and, you know, there's this Goldman Sachs report about how maybe, you know, curative therapies are not very well, you know, the, the marketplace is broken for curative therapies uh, and we need to, to retool it. Um, and what that tells you is that truly curative therapies, really impactful therapies are that rare that our current financial system cannot, doesn't know what to do with them, can't account for them. Uh, even though it made Gilead a ton of money in the end. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, I guess that's a bit we'll of a tangent. Go, but We'll just uh, yeah, jump yeah. in there. Uh, thanks so much, Sebastian. I think on behalf of all of us who have found this incredibly edifying, the way you've merged the VC side with the biotech side and talking about geroscience, I think all of us yeah. are endowed with your wisdom and will come away very enlightened after this presentation. Um, so Great. thank you very much. Um, we just want to quickly, we'll, we'll keep the call open for anyone who has further questions for Sebastian, but uh, we just want to plug uh, a few things. First thing is uh, our society, which is a new society at Oxford, the Oxford Society of Aging and Longevity. Um, and our next speaker, who, as uh, Sebastian kindly pointed out, is Aubrey de Grey, who many of you will be aware of, who's talking at the same time next week. So at 6.30 p.m. on the 23rd, um, and you'll find the links on our Facebook group. And I'll now pass over to uh, Mark just to say a few uh, concluding words. And Mark Moser is the president of the Oxford Venture Capital Network. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, and thanks again, Sebastian, for, for the talk. It was, it was really interesting. Um, also liked your unique perspective on VC itself in the comparison to, to biotech um, and, and your comparisons, both yeah, interesting and amusing. So thank you for that. Good. Um, the OxVC Society is also relatively new. Um, we've been around for a year now. Um, I'm going to plug our, our website into the chat. If you want to check it out and see what further uh, events we're, we're up to, you can sign up to a newsletter, for example. So we'll be hosting Founders Factory, a venture builder and VC geek from London uh, next week. And um, yeah, and thanks again, everybody, for showing up. And if you want to know about more about VC, um, let us know and we can help. Thanks.